And today I want to talk about Browser 3.0, how to build secure, secure Web3 clients. And I would like to start with this uh, quote. There are two ages of the internet, before Mosaic and after. The combination of protocols with a browser, which provided a great interface, proved explosive. In 24 months, the web has gone from being unknown to absolutely ubiquitous. And I like this quote because I think it's important to remind ourselves that the internet is not so old. And less than 25 years ago, no one was really talking about the latest web development framework trends. Um, no one was sharing stuff on social media uh, because the internet didn't really exist. And people were more concerned about like infrastructure things and protocols and how to scale this thing. And only a very small group of people actually had the, the knowledge and the tools, the money, the resources in general just to, to access the internet. Um, so it was very similar to what we have with Ethereum now. Um, but then something, something happened. A browser was introduced and now people actually could access the internet. And then mass adoption started. And we will probably th see this uh, once the scalability and protocol problems are solved, um, that there's some kind of mass adoption for Ethereum as well. And then some, uh, some funny, funny things can happen and I want to show you how this looks like. Uh, so we are in the year 1994. It's December 1994, and Netscape Navigator 1.0 is released. And suddenly, it is easy to access the internet, and then this happens. Everyone wants to go online. Everyone wants to experience this thing. Before, we had TV shows that would make fun of the internet, that would laugh about it, and suddenly, it is a thing. And someone noticed this, and this someone is Microsoft. Um, and when they saw what happened, they got really scared because they were really the dominant force. They were complete, completely owning the home computer market, um, and this was a big shock for them. So in July 1995, they released Windows 95, and it came pre-installed with Internet Explorer as the default browser. And some of you might say, hey, that's good. That's some healthy competition. Um, but it was pretty much illegal. And recall this browser was 1.0, and it's not called the browser disagreement or fight. No, it's called browser wars because a big corporation used all their energy and all available resources to destroy a potential threat. The internet was becoming a thing, browsers became too big. So they were going after developers on an individual basis. They tried to sue them uh, individually. This ended with an antitrust lawsuit United States versus Microsoft. Uh, they got charged with illegal tying of Internet Explorer to the Windows operating system and they had to pay hundreds of millions. And this is not super interesting. Uh, the, inter the interesting part is really this. Someone tried to mo monopolize and gain platform power over something that is decentralized, the internet. Um, and this concept of platform power is something that I want to emphasize. It means pretty much that the browsers are not just the clients that represent the infrastructure, but clients actually have the power to dicta dictate the underlying inter infrastructure and protocols. Um, they create lock-in effects, and they can, they can be gatekeepers that control who should have access and what kind of access. And if we, see, we see this even today when Google is willing to pay $12 billion a year to Apple just to remain the default search in Safari browser. So browsers are still a very interesting and lucrative target for big corporations, and they really want to own this, this space and control it as much as possible. Um, but this is not what we want. We want our tools and clients to be um, open and free as much as possible. We want them to be an extension to the regular web, but they should have the full access to the Ethereum network and all the benefits that come with it, such as computational power, smart contracts, cryptographic um, security, self sovereign identity, decentralized storage, and crypto payments. And we can call, call this tool the browser 3.0. Uh, unfortunately, this tool doesn't exist yet, and someone needs to build it, so let's build a browser. But before we are reinventing the wheel, we should just check how much work this would be. And there's Chromium, the open source project for Google Chrome, and this project has 20 million lines of code. It takes around 6,000 person years to build. Uh, the estimated costs are 320 million US dollars, 35 programming languages are used in this project, more than 50 engineers are working on it full time, um, more than 60 gigabytes of RAM are highly recommended to build it, and it takes roughly 24 hours on my machine. So that is not an option for us. We don't have these resources. 
Um, but there are certain frameworks that can help us with it. And one of them is Electron. So what is Electron? Electron already comes with Chromium pre-built, pre-bundled. Um, it has Node.js integration to customize the, the, the browser behavior. And it also has native APIs so that, that it runs on all major operating systems. It looks really promising. It looks like a really good tool that we can use. And many, many applications are already using it. And it's becoming a really big thing. And we see this for classical and developer tools, productivity, but also a lot of crypto applications that are already using Electron. And I want to focus on, before I go to this slide, I should, I should say this is a security talk. Um, I w this was the first part, and I really wanted to emphasize why we want to build this browser. But I think it, now it's becoming a little bit more technical, but if one of you in the audience just recognizes one of these um, icons here, or you may be using one of these products on a computer that uh, also has your private keys or some funds on it, then I think the next part, which is more technical, technical could still be interesting for you. Um, I want to focus on these uh, Web3 clients, which can be considered a subset of the browser 3.0. So these are clients that have access to the Ethereum network, but they can also host apps, uh, decentralized apps, and they provide an interface so that these apps can actually interact with the network. And the most prominent ones are probably MetaMask, Brave, then the Ethereum Mist, and the Parity client. And this is the approach that these projects took. So MetaMask is really convenient, and it's a great tool. Um, it's a Chrome extension. Then Brave was built on Electron, Ethereum is built on Electron, and Parity had a, a UI that was built on Electron, and now they have a wallet that is built with Electron. Um, Brave were probably the first that recognized that Electron is not the best tool to build these kind of browser or browser-like applications. And then they forked Electron um, to fix some of the security problems, and they called it Muon. And then they realized this will also not help, and now they're going completely away uh, to something that is closer to Chromium. And the Ethereumist team also realized that Electron might not be the best choice, and we have an internal project called Tau, and I will talk a little bit more about this in a second, um, that tries to fix all these security problems. Um, but before I talk more about Electron, why is not just every, if, if Electron is not such a great option, why is not everyone just building a Chrome extension? And I really wanted to motivate this with the first couple of slides, um, that, that we need some kind of diversity, and that platform power is a big problem. And besides this, being a browser plugin has more limitations. Uh, limited API access, not running in Chromium forks without extension APIs, such as Electron. It's perceived and, oh, typo, coupled to the Chrome, Firefox, or whatever the hosting application is. Um, it has no platform ownership, which is probably the, probably the biggest problem, because then this can happen. Someone decides for you that your extension should not exist anymore, should not be available anymore. And this happened. Um, the MetaMask extension was removed from the store for a couple of days, and there are more crypto extensions that got completely banned from the store. Or this happened, someone decides that all applications should not exist anymore. And this also happened. Um, there was something called Chrome Apps, and they got pretty much killed within the last two years. All of them. Okay, now I want to focus a little bit more on electron security. And there are a couple of ways how to build um, electron applications. There's a good way where you actually build a user interface with web technologies, which is what you want, or you build your, your dev with web technologies, and then you need to make some like extensions to the, to the browser, stuff that the browser does not offer you, the, a regular browser. So you design an API for this, and then when you need more access to the operating system, you write the application logic that is, that is uh, running in a separate uh, process, and you have some kind of messaging mechanism that is whitelist, whitelisting certain messages between these two processes. That's good, but it's also harder to build. And you can also do this with Electron. You can build the whole user interface code that is running in the browser. Then you don't really need an API, and you can just write your whole application code that is also running in the, in the browser window. And that's, for most applications, a really bad idea. And this is possible because of a feature, one of the core features of Electron, which is called node integration. So node integration allows you to access all the Node.js APIs from within the browser window. Um, you don't need the separation of this, these processes anymore. You can do really crazy stuff. You can exit the file system just from a regular web page. Um, this is possible, especially because 
um, the Electron project removed the sandbox from the browser, which is one of the core security mechanisms. So that's really bad, and it, it opens a really large attack surface for these applications, and we should be aware of this. Um, there's, there's our application code, but this is only at the top. Our application has de its own dependencies to NPM modules, then it's running in the Electron framework, and the Electron framework has dependencies to Chromium, Node.js, VI, and some lower level uh, APIs. And we need to be aware of the fact that every single layer can be attacked and was attacked so far. So we saw on an infrastructure level, there was a DNS attack against my Ether wallet. Then for Electron, we've seen a bunch of um, node integration bypasses. So you can actually turn the node integration off for these browser windows, but then we've seen cases where an application that was running in the browser window could turn it on again, which completely defeats the purpose of it. Uh, and, and if this was not working, they would just create a new window that had node integration on, and they would load itself, their, themselves into the new window. And then they get full, full access to the operating system, and it's, this is the security nightmare. And then they have full access to all your keys and files and whatever you store on your computer. On the dependency level, we've seen NPM modules being hacked. So someone created an NPM module, and they did not really protect their account. Someone was able to hack into this account. They modify the, the module code, and then this module is a dependency of millions of other projects, and they can infect, infect millions of other projects. Uh, on the application level, we see a bunch of cross-site scripting attacks, which is probably the, the most dominant threat there especially DOM cross-site scripting for Electron apps. Another big, really big thing for us are updates that are security critical, and I want to show you why. Uh, so for, with MIST, for example, uh, in version 10, 10, we have a dependency to Electron 1.8. In version 11, we have a dependency to Electron 2. So I, I said it before, Electron has its own set of dependencies. So Electron 1.8, for example, has a dependency to Chromium 59, then Node 8, 8.2, and V8 5.9. And Electron 2 has a dependency to Chromium 61, Node 8.9, and V8 6.1. And the latest version is for Chromium 71, for Node it's 11, and for V8 it's 7. And you don't have to remember all these numbers. I will break it down for you. The latest version is 71, the version that is used as a dependency of our Electron dependency is 61. That's a 10 version difference. Chromium has a release cycle of six weeks. That's a 60 week difference in patches, security updates, bug fixes, more than a year outdated. And it's even worse because we get this. Uh, the responsible disclosure timeline for uh, V8 bugs, for example, is not one year. It's a couple of weeks. So we have uh, documented exploits such as this, as this uh, V8 integer overflow. And you can find it online. This is, a, is an attack that works in old outdated browsers. It also works for every Electron app that is still on 1.8, for example. Um, another big problem, who is reinstalling their browser when they want to refresh a web page? I hope no one does this, because this is what crazy people do. But this is our update model right now with all the Electron apps. So in order to push a very, very simple change to the user interface, we would have to go through the whole process of, process of reinstalling all the binaries that come with it, which gives you a 60 megabyte update. Um, you need to download a new installer and then run through the whole process of updating a new browser, basically, just for very small changes. So we saw all these problems, and we wanted to fix them. And we did this with our internal project called Tau. So what is Tau? Tau is also Chromium, it's Node.js, it has native APIs. But we're doing a bunch of things in a different way. So for example, there's no Node.js integration anymore. We're also not using libchromium content that is used in Electron, but we're using CEF. And CEF is maintained by Spotify, and they're doing a really great job in providing really recent updates for the Chromium V8 and no, um, Chromium and V8 dependencies for the browser. We also uh, have, have the advantage that Chromium Embedded Framework allows us to enable a full sandbox. And for the back-end process, we can use whatever we want. So we can update to the latest V8 version, which, which is version 7, and we can update to the latest Node.js, which is version 11. And then we get these nice benefits 
So uh, V8 version 7 was released two weeks ago, and it comes with WebAssembly support for, for threads. And that's pretty cool if you think about all the stuff that we have on our roadmap for eWASM, for example, that rely on newer features that are not available in all browsers yet. We also have these ad advantages because we get all the benefits, all the changes to Node.js, all these like bug fixes and improvements to the crypto API, for example, and many of the crypto algorithms that we need to achieve our goals with Ethereum are getting implemented or already implemented in your Node versions. So that's, that, that's a massive benefit as well. So who's using Tau? Pretty much no one is using this except maybe our little like, proof of concept project. And that's a good thing, because Electron is a one-size-fits-all solution. And you have to think about it. They're going through the full bureaucracy, the, th the full backporting. They need to coordinate with Microsoft, with GitHub, with Slack, and all the other applications that we just saw. When they want to make a breaking change, it will take forever, just because they need to coordinate it very well. They cannot just break all these applications. And we have the benefit that we can actually, we can break things, we can move fast. So it's a really small project so far. I think it's extremely promising. Um, it's not meant really for the mainstream, but I, I think it's, it's good that, 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 we, that we're bringing out this message now that it exists. And it already has pre-built binaries, so you can actually test it out. It, the pre-built binaries are working on Mac and Windows so far. They are, they are known for, for Linux, but we will probably provide them within the next weeks. And this is how it looks like. You won't see a difference to a regular Chrome browser or Electron application. You will see uh, this is our new MistUI React running in one of the Tau windows. So it's, it's a browser window, and we can control and customize it, and we can run application code. And it has all the updates that we need and all the benefits that we want. And we also introduced this new update mechanism to avoid this, these painful long release cycles, uh, where we actually split our application into multiple, multiple parts. So the user interface is updated separately, and then we have something that we call the shell or the browser window, and this, this becomes interchangeable, so we can switch it between Electron or Tau, as long as we have an API that the user interface communicates with and our application logic communicates with, we can run updates pretty much every day or every week uh, for all these parts. And this is the, what we call the app shell model, and there will probably be a blog post following on our, um, on our Medium blog. We also have a bunch of uh, modules and reference implementations if you're interested to check it out. There's uh, the MistUI React project that is working in Tau and in Electron. It uh, was just recently adopted by the Ethereum, um, Ethereum GitHub repository, and then there's create React, create React app extensions, which turns every React app into an Electron Tau container, as you can call it. Then there's an updater that does hot updating for these containers for Electron or Tau apps, and then we have a reference implementation for the Electron shell and the Tau shell that can actually host one of these Electron uh, React apps for Electron or Tau. And that's it. And if you're interested in any of this, um, you can come talk to me, uh, or you can just reach out via my GitHub or my mail. Thanks. What are your thoughts about Node WebKit? Uh, my thoughts about Node WebKit, yeah. I think one of the, of the cool benefits of Electron is the, the community. So I, I said it's a disadvantage. It can also be considered as an advantage, because you actually have this like, large community. And we have the same for Ethereum. You see the benefits of many projects are already using these technologies. You get already tools for like, building update, uh, um, update mechanisms, uh, signing applications, uh, or creating installers. And I think this, the whole ecosystem for Electron is just better than for Node, than for Node WebKit. Um, but I think Node WebKit is a cool project, and it, it also go, goes in a very similar direction, so, yeah. So you said that uh, Tau is kind of like in a kind of beta sandbox development, and you're not really saying, hey, let's start using Tau. At what point should those other applications start using Tau and integrating that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there was no like real roadmap. There was never the idea that this could become something really big, and I think that it, it was also not the intention to make it a competitor to Electron, for example. Um, we started with a proof of concept. The proof of concept looked really promising, and now we're seeing like all these additional benefits and, and possibilities how it could integrate with other Ethereum projects such as Remix or the, the whole eWASM efforts, um, Swarm, and I think 
yeah, I think it looks really promising and we will probably focus all of our energy to make it the perfect fit for these applications and not any other like mainstream applications. They should probably try to use Electron and just um, put some pressure on them so that they, they fix their shit. I have a question about uh, security. Have you performed any uh, security audit on Tao? And a uh, second question, uh, have you put Tao into the like continuous integration fuzzing systems that have been uh, built by uh, Martin and, uh, and Guido? Uh, the answer is no and no. So Tao is not, was not going through a security audit. Um, MIST, of course, was going through a very, uh, very complete security audit. We learned a lot from, from these lessons and from this audit, and we tried to incorporate all the, these things that we learned into Tao but it is not in the stage where we would perform a security audit on it. And the other thing is, the other question was if we have integrated into any kind of continuous integration or continu continuous delivery mechanism, and the answer is no, because we are, um, this was of, on one of the slides, I mentioned it really briefly, we are rolling out our own mechanism for this pretty much, where we have these React app containers, and we're also thinking about stuff like how to properly sign these containers and modules, because uh, this is something that we're really missing in the whole Node.js ecosystem. You can actually put checksums on stuff, but they are the, these, these modules are not, never really signed, and we have these advantages. We know how to do it, and we, we could potentially incorporate it in our own mechanism. Okay, thank you. So, Dashtao has like an inbuilt like client of some sort, or like how does it work? Uh, the principle would be the same as for Mist, so we would uh, try to interact with Go Ethereum, for example, or with Parity, with some external client that we would download and try to update mm -hmm. through our update mechanism. There are, of course, there's of course a potential. Uh, we we saw a lot of um, like development um, for the Ethereum JS project, and there could be the the option to try out these like JavaScript libraries to make it more like a full client at some point. But uh, so far, there are no plans to turn it into a light client, full client, whatever. Okay, so you mentioned the update process of Tau versus Elect uh, Electron. Mm -hmm. um, Electron obviously is, you gotta download the whole app, even if there was a minor change on the app, 60 megabytes, whatnot. Um, I quite didn't get the update process of Tau, as in like, if I wanna update some HTML or CSS or something along the lines, do you download a smaller copy of uh, the app, or, or how does it work? So like, let's say the whole app is like still 60 megabytes, right? Yeah and then you want to update smaller processes. How do you go about doing that? Yeah, so the, the, the user interface, this yellow box is packaged separately, and then we have um, a frame for this, which is the browser frame, that includes the update mechanism, and it will actually check for newer versions of this UI. It's pretty much like a hot, hot updating mechanism for Electron apps, only that you don't have to press F5, but someone else will do it for you, and they will check um, our GitHub releases page for new updates. And we also provide like all the tools to publish these updates. They include checksums. They include the ver versioning, a, a channel if it's better release. We can even make st stage rollouts. So we can say something like 10% should update now. Um, and then the, the shell will update these new like packages, these containers, and run them. 